Hey everyone, before we begin with today's scary stories, I just wanted to let you all know that over the weekend I uploaded two brand new scary stories videos. One was a scary taxi stories video, and the other was scary security guard stories. For whatever reason, YouTube heavily suppressed those videos. I'm not really sure why, but judging by the viewership on them, YouTube didn't exactly send them out to your feeds. So make sure to go listen to them once you're done with this episode. But yeah, I just wanted to let you all know in case you missed those videos. Now, on to today's scary stories. The following tale is an exclusive story that was sent in from one of my subscribers. Here it is. Hey creepy fox, I'm back with another old story and I'm glad you have another avenue of tales to explore on reddit and let's not meet to keep the content flowing when we the subscribers don't have much to offer you. I haven't told this story because, well, I'm concerned the details might make it obvious where this comes from. It really did happen and it's a great warning to parents of teenagers that you can never be too safe. Nefarious people with nefarious purposes are always watching, waiting for an opportunity to hurt someone. Let me first explain what Code Atom is. I'm sure you've heard this being called out while shopping. It's basically an alert that a child has gone missing. They call out a description of the missing kid to all the workers in the store, and the managers take watch of all the exit points, making certain the missing child doesn't leave. I had just started working at a department store at the customer service counter. I was a young college student that entered the working class as a wide-eyed fool, thinking I'd known all the world had to offer. Two weeks into my new job, a frantic middle-aged woman came up to the service counter. Her daughter, age 13, had disappeared. She was by her side one minute. The next, she was gone. She described her daughter and what she was wearing. In spite of her best efforts, however, a half hour later, the girl was not found. Police were called. The mother, in hysterics, all headed to the security room to review the video surveillance. This was 20 or more years ago. CCTV wasn't as great as today's version. The girl had managed to sneak away when the mom was talking with a friend and managed to head to the main exit. From there, she headed to a small red pickup that could have been a Ford or a Chevy and the plate seemed to be covered by something. The camera also could not get a good angle of the driver's face. Police went to look for this truck around the area but they found nothing. After interviewing the brother of this girl, they found out that she had been talking with someone in an online chat room. She had been chatting with a man who asked her to meet him that night in the parking lot of the store that her mother was taking her to, explaining how she could sneak away from her mom when she was distracted. Three days later, almost seven miles from this store, some people in a subdivision complained of a bad smell coming from the nearby house that had been for sale the last month. They thought it might be a raccoon that got stuck somewhere in the house and passed away. However, they found the girl's mutilated body in the bathtub. During the time of this abduction and murder, there was a local celebration. Neighbors never saw or heard anything due to the fireworks going off at the time and they never did find out the girl's killer. Now, I know that we want our children to learn to go out in the world on their own, but we need to keep watch while they do. Anyway, be safe, and be careful. Age, I was 20. Gender, female. Setting, a motorway in the southwest, slashed West Midlands of England. 1990. So I was what was known at the time as a crusty, though I read that they're called gutter punks in the United States. I had dreadlocks, listened to anarcho punk, and dressed in rags. I was a softy from the countryside by birth, but a couple of years in the violent Nottingham squatter scene had hardened me up no end. I left the squats and joined the new age travelers. 
and we were as aggressive of a bunch of heavy drinking thieves as you likely to meet anywhere in the UK at the time. For this very reason, I was fearless, but youth and a safe upbringing made me stupid when I thought I was streetwise. As was my habit, I'd taken myself off on my own and gone back to my hometown. Now I was hitchhiking the breath of the country to get back to the site where my friends were. I remember waiting for my next lift at a service station, and this is when this battered old three-wheeled van pulled up. It was filthy and didn't look very pleasant, but it was going in my direction, so I was pleased. But the driver seemed okay, a bit serious and intense I suppose, but he said that he could take me to the other side of Birmingham, which was very convenient for me. It was distinctive looking. This was the start of the 90s, but he looked like my dad during the 70s, and my dad was old-fashioned in his whole life. The man had a thick black hair and a bit of a quiff, and sideburns. He was also v tanned like he worked outdoors a lot. He was lean, with dark eyebrows. I remember him so well because he looked like my dad, and also my uncle. Maybe this was why I didn't feel less at ease with him. So we start along the motorway, and it all seemed fine. I was probably chatting like an idiot as usual, and I remember glancing in the back of the van and seeing a heap of junk in there, bulky and dirty, and some of it covered with a black cloth. He saw me looking at it and said it was equipment for a puppet show, which I found quite bizarre. He didn't look like a children's entertainer. He was more a child catcher than friendly clown. Along the road a bit, and he started asking me how often I hitch, and I let him know it's routine for me. He says, but don't you get scared? So I say, no, not really. But the guy won't leave it. You must get scared. No, I really don't. Why don't you get scared? I can handle myself. And so he goes on, and on. He insists I must be scared, and asks me if I'm scared now, and how I know I would be able to handle being attacked, and I'm getting really irritated. A bit freaked out because it seems like he wants me to be scared and I'm giving the wrong answer, but mostly annoyed because the conversation is going in circles. Eventually, when he asks why, I reply with, I don't get scared because I carry a knife. This was true, but only a little lock knife for day-to-day -day purposes. Well, that stopped the line of questions. In fact, it stopped the whole lift. The guy swerved into the hard shoulder at the side of the road and said, I'll have to drop you off here. I was surprised and a bit pissed off to be left here, but I got out and grumbled to myself as he drove off. Cars aren't allowed to stop on the hard shoulder, and people certainly aren't allowed to walk along it, but what could I do? I stuck my thumb out and started walking. About 15 minutes later, a police car pulled up, and told me off for being there, but kindly gave me a lift across to the far side of Birmingham. This was to a safe and legal hitching spot, where I was picked up by a minibus full of pagan students who took me right to the traveler site. Years went by. I left the sites and the squats, had a baby, got a job, and the only time I thought about this guy was when exchanging hitching stories with people. It wasn't until a couple of years ago that I realized the possible danger I had been in. I was watching a show called Crime Watch on the BBC, where they appeal for information, and they had a special on the serial killer, Peter Tobin. They were trying to track his movements throughout the years. I myself follow serial killer stories with interest, so I'd heard of him and had seen his picture as an old man. Then they showed pictures of him throughout the years. Holy smokes, there he was, the mad puppeteer, the picture had matched, the time matched, just how he looked in the late 80s, early 90s. This included how he looked when he murdered hitchhiker Dina McNichol in 1991. I worked for the criminal justice system, so I have level-headed colleagues, mostly, and told people at work. They all agreed I should ring the crime watch number. If it was nothing... It could do no harm. If it was something, it might really help. So I rang the crime watch number and said, It's probably nothing. 
A few days later, they rang back and arranged to take a statement. A police officer came to my house and wrote everything down. A few days later, a second police officer came to my workplace to get more information and a photocopy a diary I kept back then. Frustratingly, I said nothing about this lift in the diary. That's how little I thought I was in danger. The Crime Watch website updated to mention the three-wheeled van and now it's reported in some biographies as fact. People ask me now if I truly believe that was Peter Tobin who gave me that lift. I can never be too sure. But I think in my mind, I'm 75% sure I survived a serial killer. At the very least, I now realize how stupid and naive I was, feeling so tough and so fearless. Sometimes when I think of what could have happened, I just feel cold and sick because of my job. I realize how many psychopaths are out there and how I'm just relieved it wasn't my parents searching for answers about one of his victims. TLDR Silly me, aged 20 years old, gets a weird lift hitching and discovers 20 years later that I might have had a very lucky escape from Peter Tobin. I'm not really sure how familiar anyone is with WWE, but back in March of 2017, my girlfriend and I decided to take our annual trip to Orlando, Florida, and this was earlier in the year than usual. Now, I've always been a huge wrestling fan, and it was always a dream since I was a kid to attend WrestleMania. WrestleMania 33 was taking place in Orlando that year, and I figured it would be my best chance to finally go since it was, well, in Orlando. It was easier to convince my girlfriend to do this trip since I could take her to Disney and Universal as well. Fast forward to WrestleMania itself, and the show was great. It's an experience I'll never forget, for both good and bad reasons. Anyway, once the show ended, us, along with the 70,000 other people, were leaving the show and trying to get Ubers back to the hotel. And if anyone is familiar with Uber, I'm sure you're aware the price is getting jacked up whenever there's a large supply and demand. Put it this way. It would have cost us $100 for a 15 minute ride. Now WrestleMania took place at what used to be known as the Citrus Bowl. Now it's the Camping World Stadium, I believe. I wasn't familiar with the area since I'm from New York and I didn't realize how ghetto the neighborhood really was. Like something out of a movie. Seriously, look it up. Anyway, we decide that because the prices were so high, we try to walk as far away from the stadium as possible to try and get a cheaper Uber. About a half hour into his walking, we are a little more than a mile away from the stadium, and it's around 12.30 to 1 a.m. at this point. The neighborhood was practically a ghost town, with few wrestling fans here and there still walking. My girlfriend was complaining about her feet hurting, and she wanted to call her mom. So we stop and sit at a bench at a bus stop approximately two minutes into the conversation with her mom i realized that some guy in a hoodie walks up behind us after he walked out from behind an abandoned house he asks us to use my girlfriend's phone and she says she's on the phone right now so the guy stands behind us for another five minutes or so and i finally had enough i recall i said you're not using her phone and he said excuse me i said you're not using her phone. We don't know you. So he gets frustrated and says, Why do you make me wait here all this time to use the phone if you weren't going to let me use it? So I was getting equally heated and told him to go to hell because we don't owe him anything. My girlfriend was getting scared at this point because she knows I'm a hothead and this wasn't going to end well. She grabs my arm and tells me, Let's go. So we start walking again but now the guy is following us on his bicycle. So finally I turned around and asked him what his problem was. We start arguing again, and at this point, I tell him to once again, go to hell and screw off. Except this time, he pulled a gun from his belt and points it at me. I don't know what I really thought at this point. The only thing that came out of my mouth was, that's just going to make your situation worse. At this point, I think I had received my biggest stroke of luck, 
as a police officer just happened to be at a red light across the street, so the guy flew off on his bicycle after realizing there was a cop. The light turned green, and the cop continued on his way. Me and my girlfriend ran across the street to the only convenience store open, which had a few wrestling fans in there. We begged the guy behind the counter to call the cops, and everyone in the store asked us what happened. After explaining it to them, everyone was scared to leave the store. About an hour and a half goes by, and I ask the guy behind the counter where the cops are. He tells me, I didn't call them. So basically, an hour and a half went by at that point. No cops were called whatsoever. So I call the cops myself, and the dispatcher basically accused me of being on drugs because I waited so long to call. She then asked me to go back to the corner where the guy pulled the gun on me so I could get the name of the street. Since I was on vacation, I didn't know the area. I still think to this day that it was ridiculous that a trained dispatcher tried getting me to go back to a corner where I almost got robbed. Then, they wanted me to get the corner street when the guy in the convenience store was willing to give me the address of his store, and then I could explain the corner or even show the corner to the cop when he would arrive. Anyway, she sent an officer out for us, and go figure it was the cop from the red light earlier on, who admitted he saw the guy confronting us and saw my girlfriend wave him down to help us out, but didn't think much of it. Gee, thanks officer. He then pulls up the laptop in his car and shows us a picture of a male who looked just like the guy who pulled the gun on us. The cop explains that about 10 minutes after the guy fled the scene from me and my girlfriend, he confronted another couple. He asked to use their phone. They actually let him, and he pulled a gun on them and took both their phones and the girl's purse. The cop then ordered us an Uber and we went on our way. My girlfriend was traumatized the rest of our trip and still holds it over my head that I almost got a shot because I couldn't keep my mouth shut. If there is any lesson to be learned from this, it would definitely be to do some research on areas you're unfamiliar with. You just never know what's going to happen. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. If you haven't already done so, make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it so you can be notified of any and all future scary stories narration videos coming here to the Creepy Fox YouTube channel. I'm sure you're going to enjoy your stay. Now, let's continue on with these scary stories. For a little bit of background, we lived with our grandparents. Our dad had died, and our mom had gotten into drugs. Our grandparents had this huge 80-acre plot of land, had a bunch of trails that had been made for deer hunting, and four-wheeling as well. Along those trails were handmade deer stands that we were allowed to use as tree houses when it was off-season. The town was very rural. Our driveway was half a mile long, and the closest neighbor took about half an hour to bike to. The town only had about 1,200 people in it, so everyone pretty much knew each other. You know how it goes. When this happened, I was about 10 years old, and my sisters were 15. We had just gone on summer vacation the week before. S wanted to go to her friend's house. Her friend was the closest neighbor. Our grandparents let her go on the condition that I go with her, and I was super excited. S was less than thrilled. As soon as we got to our driveway, S picked up the speed, wanting to leave her dumb little sister behind. It worked. Pretty soon I couldn't even see her anymore. I wasn't too worried about this, however. It wasn't the first time she had left me behind and I knew the way to her friend's house. I had only been riding for about five minutes and then I heard a honk. I pulled up closer to the side of the road as there were no sidewalks, but they honked again. When I turned around, I saw that it was a rusty red truck. There was a crack in the windshield and fuzzy dice hanging from the rearview mirror. I put up the kickstand and walked to the driver's door, thinking that it was one of my grandfather's friends. It wasn't though. He was younger than my grandpa, around 40 years old. He had greasy blonde hair. He was covered in dirt and engine oil. 
His teeth were very yellow and I could see silver caps when he smiled. I waited for him to roll down the window figuring he needed directions. I myself was always social and even to this day I struggled to say no to people. He had a huge grin on his face. He asked me what I was doing out there. I told him that I was riding my bicycle down to a friend's house and that S had left me behind. God, I was dumb. He told me he could give me a ride, which I ended up declining. He got a little bit mad and said he was just trying to help me. He then asked me if I liked puppies. I said yes and told him about my puppy Figaro that I had gotten the year before. He told me that he had a puppy and that I should look in the back of the truck where he was. I walked back. He got out of the truck and opened the back. It had one of those roof thingies, but there was nothing there. He grabbed my arm, but I was able to pull away. I ran right into the woods, and I quickly found an old trail and climbed into one of the deer stands. It had wedges cut into the tree and had a little platform with a chair to sit in. I sat up there, and I started crying, but I thought for sure he was going to find me and I'd never see my family again. I could then hear the man shouting at me, telling me to stop being a bitch and to go with him instead. If I didn't, he was going to make everything worse for me. Eventually, he went away, but I was too afraid to go down for fear that he was just out of sight waiting for me instead. S and her friend came back down the road about half an hour later and found my mangled bike. S freaked out and started screaming for me. I came down then and went over to her. I told S all about the creepy man. He must have run over my bike when he left, we thought. S didn't want to get in trouble for leaving me behind, so I had to tell my grandma that it was my fault the bike had gotten broken. I ended up being grounded for two weeks. I never told my grandparents, and I never saw the man ever again, and I hope I never do. TLDR Creepy man tries to kidnap me and I end up getting grounded for two weeks. Every summer with a few friends, we take a trip to the seaside of France for about a week. Last year, we decided to go to Hosker on the southwestern coast so we could go surfing, but we ended up in a small touristic village. It is known as Moliets et Ma, an hour from where we were supposed to go and this was because of a reservation mix-up. The week was going okay until the last three days of the trip, but the story I'm going to tell is the last nights. So the past two days we had been in trouble with the police and a few other tourists because of some misunderstandings over a pack of cigarettes. We had spent the last two nights stressing and trying to cool things off, and therefore, we thought the last night we spent there couldn't be as bad as those two, and it couldn't possibly be as we were leaving the next day, and this was going to be very early in the morning. So we had only planned to go to a restaurant for dinner with some friends. They were ones we met there to celebrate the trip. The dinner was going great. We were all having fun, and as time passed by, it started getting dark. Towards the end of the meal, my best friend Dennis, who was driving us home the next day, thought it was best for him to leave early and not drink too much so he could sleep as soon as possible and be in the best shape for long driving that was coming up. He left about 15 minutes before the rest of the group while we stayed and drank a bit more. We paid the check and as soon as I got up from my chair, I received a message from Dennis. Call me. There's a guy following me. Here's what ended up happening. Dennis had to pass through a caravan parking lot and a golf to get back to the residence in which we had rent a house. While he was in a parking lot, he noticed someone behind him that was about his size, one meter, seventy, with a hood and a cap on. At first he didn't think anything of him as the village was actually quite touristic and there were a lot of people usually passing by the parking lot. But when Dennis stopped to pee on a tree, he had a glimpse of the guy behind him stopping and hiding behind another tree a few feet back. As soon as he got to walking again, the guy stepped out from behind the tree and started following him again up to the gulf. As Dennis got there, he was a bit creeped out, especially since at night the gulf is completely dark, only lit by the moonlight, 
and empty of people. He stopped again for a second to light a cigarette and checked if the guy was still behind him. Once again, the guy stepped out of the path and hid behind a tree until Dennis started walking again. That's when he understood that he was in danger. The guy wasn't physically imposing, and so Dennis thought it was weird he was so confident in following him, maybe because he was holding onto a knife, or even possibly, a gun. Nevertheless, Dennis kept walking and acting as if he hadn't noticed anything, although the guy was following him again and sent me the message. Call me, there's a guy following me. As soon as I picked up, he talked loudly to try and scare off the guy by saying, Hey, you're at the golf with the other eight, right? No problem, I'll be there in a minute. Even though we were five and absolutely not at the golf, which was terrifying for me, but it was clever because it made me understand that he wasn't joking and where he was. I swore to him everything was going to be okay and that I would be there in five minutes and told him to be careful and safe trying to go home. As soon as I hung up, I started running towards the golf and explained very briefly to my friend that Dennis was in trouble and we had to get to that golf as soon as possible. Meanwhile, when I hung up, Dennis put the phone back in his pocket and kept walking. He took a glance back and saw the guy was still a few meters behind him. He took a last puff of the cigarette he had lit two minutes before and then threw it and started running towards the residence. As he was running, he took a look back and saw the guy started running too. It lasted for about five minutes before he got in front of our house, which was empty. When he got there, he stopped for a second, looked back one last time. The guy was about 10 meters behind him, in the middle of the alley. He was in mobile and then went to hide behind one of the cars that were on the side of it. As soon as Dennis saw that, he panicked. He barged into the house, locked the door with difficulty, grabbed the biggest knife he could get in the house, and waited on the couch facing the entrance to the house, which was a glass canopy. When me and my friends got there, he was scared, but unhurt. He explained everything to us, and then we went looking for the guy in a group of four people. The neighbors hadn't seen anyone other than us, and even though we got to the residence at first in separate groups, at different times and throughout two different entrances, we didn't see anyone coming out of them. He had completely just disappeared. Nothing was stolen, even though we had left the clothes to dry outside of the house, and nobody was hurt, so we didn't call the police. However, we warned the neighbors, and me and two others stayed up all night outside to look out for the guy, as he had seen where we lived and where we were afraid he would return during the night. Dennis had been lucky. We never knew what were the intentions of this guy or if he was hiding something that gave him the advantage over my friend. Furthermore, he didn't even try to get into the house, and good for Dennis because there was another entrance to the house, another glass canopy that led to one of our friend's rooms, and which had not been correctly closed. We couldn't even understand what he did. If he wanted to steal from Dennis or murder him, he could have done it two separate times, when he went to pee and when he lit his cigarette, but he didn't. So, what did he want? Who was he? Where did he go? I don't think we'll ever get an answer. We can only hope he never did anything to anyone and was arrested if he did. We didn't call the cops back then, because we had trouble with them the past two days because of the problem with the pack of cigarettes I talked about before. Also, after those three days had gone wrong, we just wanted it to end, go home and sleep, etc. I regret not calling them now that I think about it, but it's too late now and I hope this guy hasn't been creeping on anybody since. We were all extremely tired the next day, and the drive that was supposed to be five or six hours long took 10 hours to complete under the heavy summer heat. However, with that said, we all got home safely, slept well, never had any problems of that sort since then, and we now laugh about it. The end. To conclude, I would advise you to never walk alone at night in places you don't know much about. 
but there are crazy and weird people everywhere you go, and a calm night can quickly turn into a nightmare if you're not careful and you don't watch your surroundings. Thank you for reading this. Hope you liked it and that it made you think about being more careful at night. This is a story that's really been bothering me lately for absolutely no reason whatsoever. A few months ago, I just had this dream that brought back this memory. I tried to suppress it growing up, but as of recently it's been weighing on my mind. Growing up, in 2005, on the edge of the suburbs, there was a large grove of trees and hills by some railroad tracks that led to a big forest about a half mile from my house. When I was nine years old, me and my neighborhood friends would ride our bikes to the railroad tracks and we would walk to the forest to go explore the random pieces of furniture and junk in this particular forest. We'd play card games, do homework, and hang with friends out there for about an hour or two, but never sat out there too long. There were small abandoned houses here and there in this forest that we stayed away from, as one neighborhood friend, Michael, told me there was a homeless man who lived in one of them, and if you saw him, run. So right off the bat after hearing this, going near this house in the woods was scary as could be. One chilly November afternoon, after school, I came home and dropped off my backpack at my house and immediately went into the woods. My bike was broken, so I ended up walking. Michael had told me at school that day to meet him in this open area of the forest so that we can play Pokemon together. This was something we'd frequently do growing up, just to pass the time until our parents got home at 4pm, so it was nothing unusual. As I crossed the railroad tracks into the forest, I instantly felt a weird sensation, that feeling you feel when someone is watching you. I looked around and couldn't see anyone, so I thought I was just getting spooked, as the rather overcast day was very eerie anyway. Tracking through the autumn leaves scattered across this large wooded area, I came upon the big open area where I was supposed to meet up with Michael. Near the area where we normally met was his notebook, and it was open. On the page was written, Hey, I had to go back home and grab some batteries for my Game Boy. Wait for me here. I'll be back soon. Michael. I waited. Being alone, especially feeling like someone was watching me, made this particular moment very uncomfortable. However, I convinced myself I was just being a wuss and decided to wait for Michael. I sat down and began playing my Game Boy. It wasn't too long until that sensation of being watched grew into utter paranoia. I kept frantically looking up for my Game Boy and checking my watch to see how long I'd been waiting for. I'd been sitting there for about 30 minutes. It was now beginning to get dark. Then, I heard some leaves crunch. I looked in the direction of the sound and briefly saw a dark hooded figure peeking from behind a few trees and then hide back behind them. My skin crawled and I immediately jumped up from where I was sitting and froze in my tracks, staring. I screamed, hello, to see if anyone was there. I was very quickly reminded I wasn't alone when I saw this tall, dirty looking hooded man peek back around from trees. He called back, hey buddy. I picked up Michael's notebook and ran for my life. I ran so fast I barely had time to look behind me. However, I heard leaves crunching not too far behind me. It was the man running after me. He was screaming for me to come back, and I just wanted to talk to you. I'm sorry, he said. I began crying as I was running, thinking this was exactly how those missing kids disappear. I ran and ran, and I ran until I literally tripped over the railroad tracks and cut my knees up. Michael was just getting back to the railroad tracks. He saw me, dirty and bloody and crying hysterically, and I screamed at him to run. Without question, we ran all the way home. The hooded man was nowhere to be seen once we left the railroad tracks. I last saw him standing in the woods, defeated that he couldn't catch up to me or something. I don't know. I told Michael everything, and we never went back to the woods ever again.
Years later, in 2016, they bulldozed the woods and built a neighborhood there. We later found out from fellow neighborhood friends who were in the area that the same thing happened to them growing up. And to this very day, this is probably one of my scariest stories from growing up. Hi guys. I've never made a post anywhere on Reddit before, but I'm always reading and lurking. I was reading so many Let's Not Meet stories that it made me want to share mine. I'm sure the format of this won't be great, but I will do my best. So when I was 13 years old, my friend, who we will call Mary, had a grandma who ran a nail salon downtown. I grew up in a really small town in Alaska. And when I was younger, it seemed like it really was a safe place. As I got older, I realized just how corrupt and horrible it actually was. But at 13 years old, I still wasn't totally aware of that. After school, Mary and I would always walk to her grandma's nail salon. It was in a building with a few other shops, and we would kind of just hang out and browse. There was a Thai restaurant that was our favorite ever, and we'd eat there a lot too and were pretty good friends with the restaurant's owners. After some months of the same routine, just hanging out every day caused me and Mary's family to become more like family. Her grandmother, who we'll start calling Gretchen, had the idea of wanting to open a little coffee stand in there. The other shops were a cookware store, a clothes consignment shop, a game shop, and a couple of other random ones. So we figured it would have a nice business, and she wanted Mary and I to work the coffee stand while she was in the nail salon. I partly believe it was that she just simply wanted us out of her hair. Anyway, we went and trained properly, but since we were 13, we were being paid under the table. We had set it up right in front of the Thai restaurant. After about a week of the coffee stand being up and running, this guy who looked about 18 to 20 years old showed up. He would get a small vanilla latte every day and just sit in the mall and kind of watch his work, but also browse around the game shop, so we just kind of thought maybe he lived nearby and liked to come there every single day. And who knows, maybe we hadn't noticed him because he obviously wouldn't be coming to get his nails done. He honestly looked kind of dirty and like he didn't care that much. When the months got hotter, we started walking home instead of our mom driving us. There were a lot of kids walking around, so I didn't notice very much if people were behind me or in front of me. One of the nights we closed up shop a little bit late. It was about 9pm, which in Alaska is still fully sunny, and I noticed that someone was walking behind me kinda close. I stopped dead in my tracks and didn't hear anything, so I kept walking and I was sure I heard it this time, and I turned around and there he was, the same guy that is in the mall every day, following me. I was 13 years old and shy, so I just kept walking and I made a loop around and just walked to the mayor's office, because the police station was too far. I now called my dad from there because I felt safe and he came to get me. This repeated in slightly different ways for about two weeks, and eventually, I don't know how to this day, he found out where I lived. He would knock on the door, leave flowers, call her home phone, all kinds of crazy stuff. My dad finally helped me get a restraining order, but it took about a month to get anyone to take us seriously and come see him at my workplace, as we had no idea what his name was. Once that was in effect, it stopped for only about a week and he started showing up again. He continued stalking my home and even hanging out by the fence of my school when school was back in session. Finally, I had enough. I moved in with my mom because she was, quite frankly, a better parent to me and taking it way more seriously. She lived so far out that I couldn't walk anywhere and she had no electricity or running water, but I didn't care anymore. I felt so much safer and so much more loved. I quit that job and I took the bus every day. Eventually, he just disappeared and I never heard about him ever again. Here 
here's another story that was sent in from a subscriber a couple of months ago. Hey there, here is a story for you. Hopefully it works this time, and I hope you're doing well. Gunner is my 6 month old German Shepherd and is just shy of 30 kilograms. Everywhere I go with him without fail, but there is always someone who tells me how important it is to have him socialized, as German Shepherds can become quite dangerous. Even the vet every single time pushes to ensure I train him, even at the slightest sign of aggression. But I actually don't care, but I digress. On with the story. Early this evening, just as the sun was beginning to set, I was getting something from my car parked on the street out the front of my house. My eldest son, who is 16 years old, he was a premie all those years ago, has related health issues due to that. He's only around 5 foot 2 and barely 50 kilograms, with not an ounce of muscle on him. He had come out with Gunner as he was taking him for a walk. As I was walking back towards the house and my son had crossed the road, I noticed a man heading in the same direction as my son. No big deal, but you would think they're just someone walking, right? Except he failed to notice me standing at my front gate. He said something I couldn't make out and right before my eyes, I see this man speed up almost to a run and slide his hood over his head as he quickly approached my son, a nightmare for any parent and a danger you would never expect only for homes from your own. As useless as I am, I froze. Please don't come at me, I hate myself enough but we cannot control a fear response no matter how much we wish we can. I watched on with dread I have never felt, the moment the guy slides his hood up over his head and sped up with intent. I just knew that his intentions were to hurt my son, who was oblivious to his surroundings, fiddling with his phone with his earphones in, as I'm guessing trying to find the right song to match his walk. Right as the man was within arm's reach of my son, and his body language made it blatantly obvious he was going to in the very least grab my son as he began reaching out his arm. The goodest boy Gunner swung around from in front of my son to in between him and the man and let out a bark I wasn't aware a puppy could make. Gunner began towards the man barking and growling as the man hadn't stopped with his first bark. I watched frozen with horror when my dog then put all his weight into pulling my son further away and getting himself closer to the man who decided last second not to take on the dog guarding my son. The man then flicked his hood back down and proceeded to continue on his path after stepping back and away from my son, yelling back at my son to get the dog under control. Finally, my feet unfroze and I jumped in my car, following my son and the dog around the block until they got home. That was to make sure the guy didn't double back or come out from another street to have another go. So please, never let your guard down, no matter how close to home you are, or even if the sun is still out, and always be aware of your surroundings. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that that man intended on harming my son, and had it not been for the goodest boy Gunner, this would have played out very horrifyingly different. I remembered something that happened to my best friend and I a few years ago and figured I might share it here. While my best friend, at the time, and I were seniors in high school, 2016-ish, we went on a weekend trip to visit my grandmother a couple of hours away from my town in Georgia, the United States. The town we lived in was completely small for this state, but one of the largest towns within a few hours but we had to travel about two and a half hours through tiny, somewhat redneck towns to get to my grandmother's place. We were on our way back home when we had to stop at a gas station literally in the middle of nowhere. I'm talking cornfields, cotton fields, streets with no signs or lights, not even stop signs, and definitely no cell phone service. The convenience store attached to the gas station had maybe a couple of snacks inside, looked deserted from the outside, no other cars or people in sight, and we didn't bother to get anything other than gas. I paid with card, 
mainly because I didn't want to leave my 5 foot 1, 100 pound friend alone in the car while I went alone inside. Another car pulled up on the other side of the single gas pump while I just started pumping gas myself, and because of everything I'd read on this subreddit, I already had a weird feeling and decided to stay alert and stand outside of the car with my driver's side door open so my friend could see and hear everything going on. A thin, late 50-ish older man got out of the car and seemed to be paying at the pump and standing beside his car while he got gas. But after a few seconds, he walked around the pump and maneuvered himself around my car door so he could stand within a foot of me and then he asked if he could pump my gas for me. Luckily, my gas nozzle was locked, so it was pumping without me having to hold it, and now I immediately placed myself between the opening of the door and the man, and I prepared to either shut the door with me inside, or move and slam it behind me to protect my friend if necessary. I calmly told him that it was fine, no thank you. He then looked me up and down with a corner of his lip tilted up, and said, Pretty girls like you shouldn't be out here all alone. You definitely shouldn't have to do this by yourself. Let a man help you out, baby. And then he covered my hand with his own as he reached for the gas pump I was holding. I jerked my hand out from underneath his and slammed my car door shut. I was thinking that the last thing I would ever want is him jumping in my car and driving away with my friend in the passenger seat. Orange flags started tinting red and my usual overly polite demeanor turned serious as I remembered something I'd read here before. It said, It was better to be safe and to seem mean, rather than be polite and uncomfortable. So I responded and said, Sir, get away from me. I can pump my own gas, and I have already said no thank you. Leave us alone. He didn't move at all. He only raised his chin and managed to make eye contact with me all lip tilt gone. I stared him down and figured that I'd gotten enough gas to last us enough time to get the hell out of wherever we were. So I maintained eye contact. I pulled out the nozzle and basically threw it back onto the pump before getting in my car and drove away before he had even moved. As we drove away, I glanced in the rearview mirror and saw that his car wasn't even being filled up with gas. That told me that he was driving by and decided to help a damsel in distress out. I put help in air quotations. My friend was shaking the whole way home, telling me she would have just let the man pump her gas. However, I'm just glad that some of the confidence I gained from this subreddit helped me stay attentive and respond confidently enough to get us out of that situation. So creepy helpful gas station man in the middle of a ghost town, Georgia. Let's not meet. TLDR. Man tries grabbing the gas pump from out of my hand so he can pump gas for me. He then proceeds to explain that I should let a man help me. I managed to get out of there and realize that he wasn't even pumping gas for himself to begin with. This all started about a year ago. I, 23 years old, female, lived on the second floor of an apartment complex and have lived here my entire life. The building is mostly comprised of families with young children and married couples. A lot of the families have lived here as long as my family has, so everyone knows each other pretty well. There is only one apartment unit that isn't occupied by a family but rather by a pair of brothers who keep to themselves. One day, one of their sons, around my age, appeared out of the blue. He was strange off the bat. He would always wear a sweatshirt with a hood up and would run through the apartment complex to get to his apartment. I'm not sure what his face looks like because he always had the hood up over his face. He lived on the first floor, on the back side of the complex, and would often get into his place by jumping through the window. He basically did everything in his power to avoid any interaction. I didn't mind him because I never saw him due to my busy schedule. However, one day, he started sitting on top of the staircase that leads to my apartment. This was strange because his apartment unit was on the other side of the complex and on the first floor. 
I brushed it off at first, but it started happening every day. When I would come home from school, he was there. When my boyfriend at the time would drop me off at night, typically around 10.30 to 11 p.m., he would be there. Sometimes when I would leave, he would come back hours later and he would still be in the exact same spot, almost as if he didn't move throughout that five-hour period I was gone. At this point, I told my parents and my boyfriend about it, and they became very vigilant. My boyfriend would park his car and walk me to my door every night he dropped me off. Once he saw my boyfriend, he stopped sitting on the staircase and I thought it was over, but it wasn't. He started waiting for me at my bus stop. The bus I take home from school stops right across the street from my home, so it is a short walk. One day when I was getting off, I saw him waiting at the bus stop. Once he saw me get off, he followed me into the complex and sat on the staircase. He also started following me when I would walk my dog. At this point, my parents were upset. My mom started letting the neighbors know that he was following me around. My neighbors started making sure that he wasn't bothering me, or if I was alone, they would start a conversation with me until I got into my door. One day, I got a friend request on Facebook from this guy. Mind you, he had never spoken a word to me, so how did he know my name, let alone to find me on Facebook? My mom tried talking to his father, but they would never answer the door when my mom knocked on their door. So, I'm thinking, it can't possibly get any worse, right? He seemed harmless, so I wasn't too worried, but I was wrong. One day when I returned from my boyfriend's house, my mom told me that she had something to tell me, but she didn't want me to get spooked. She proceeded to tell me that when she was walking towards the kitchen to get a glass of water, she saw something in the tree move. Our kitchen has a huge window that takes up most of the wall. In front of the window, there's a huge tree. If someone were to climb the tree, then you could see into our apartment. Well, guess what? When my mom took a closer look, she realized my neighbor was sitting in the tree and looking straight into the apartment. My mom called my dad over and when my neighbor saw my dad, he jumped off the tree. At that moment, I felt peace stolen from me. We filed a police report, but when the police went looking for him, he was gone. It turned out that there were snack wrappers and a blanket hidden between the leaves of the trees. The police think that this wasn't the first time he was up in that tree. I couldn't help but to wonder just how many times he saw me walking around and I had no idea. It's been about six months and I haven't seen him since. His father still lives in the complex, but there's no sight of him. The police haven't been able to find him. So I have no idea what happened to him, but I hope we never meet again. Some backstory. My parents split when I was about 14 years old. It wasn't a good breakup either. My dad was an abusive drug addict, so when my mom left him, she was in a really bad place. Her and my older sister, my sister was in her 20s, and was full-blown party mode, kept taking her to local bars since my mom was depressed. This led my mom to becoming an alcoholic, since my sister was well on her way to becoming one too. During one of these nights, she met a guy. I didn't know much about him, just that they met him and his brother at a bar and now she was dating him. It went pretty fast, and my sister would flirt with a brother to get free food and drinks from him. Around this time, I was about 15 years old, and this dude just seemed really off. He was probably early 40s or so, and he was always going on my mom's dates with his brother. He just kinda hung around a lot. One day, my sister decided that she wanted sushi and called her brother up to take us because she knew he would pay. I did not want to go, but we didn't have food in the house, and I was pretty hungry. Actually, we didn't have a sushi place in our town, so we had to drive to the city which was about 30 minutes away. The entire ride, I just had this warning feeling in my stomach. It kept telling me to get out of the car and that this was a bad idea. I was a giant ball of anxiety the whole 30 minutes. My sister sat in the front seat 
completely oblivious to what was happening. Meanwhile, I kept catching him staring at me in the rearview mirror. Once we got to the restaurant, he sat himself directly across from me. He wanted to sit next to me, but I rushed to sit next to my sister instead. It was awkward, but my sister talked a lot, so I was able to kinda hide. Eventually, she got up to go to the bathroom, and then I was alone with him. Almost immediately, he asked me if I had a boyfriend, and I said no. That's good, he said. You're too good for high school boys. They're only after one thing. I just nodded not knowing what to say. He then went on to ask if I liked Disneyland, and I said yes. He got excited and went on about how he would take me to Disneyland, but the hotels were expensive, so we would have to share a room. It would just be us so my mom and his brother could be alone. He said my sister couldn't come though because he couldn't afford to pay for both of us to go. At this point, I was extremely uncomfortable and I just wanted my sister to return. She finally did and he switched to just talking to her. She didn't notice that anything was wrong or that he kept looking at me. Once we finished, he took us home and invited himself in. I went to my room, locked the door, and I hid. At one point, someone tried to open my door, but they stopped once they felt it was locked. My mom and her boyfriend came home around then. I tried talking to my sister, but she just brushed me off. They had invited us back to their house, and I wanted so badly to stay home, but they forced me to go. Almost immediately, my mom and her boyfriend went to the room and left my sister and I with them. He got my sister drunk pretty fast and tried to get me to drink as well, but I kept refusing. It got to the point where my sister was almost blacked out drunk, and I was freaking out because once she passed out, it would just be us. So I started texting my brothers, hoping one of them would pick me up. Thank God my eldest brother responded. I told them what was happening and he came to get me. He showed up and told the guy that it was late and I had school so he was taking me home. He tried to protest but my brother was very firm about it. He loaded my sister in the car, texted my mom he was taking us home, and then we left. My brother didn't live with us since he was about 30 years old at the time, and he had his own family so he didn't know what was going on. I told him the full story, and he got quiet really fast, and then waited until my mom got home. He basically told her off, shamed her for putting me in that situation, and told her that if it continued, he would move me into his house. My mom broke down and told him that she wanted to break up with her boyfriend, because of his brother. I found out when I was older that he would sneak by the door to listen to them when they had sex. I think more happened, but my mom never talked about it more than that. She broke up with him, got a job, and sobered up with the help of my brother. It took my sister a lot longer, but she eventually got her life together as well. So the creepy brother of my mom's ex-boyfriend. Let's not meet again. To preface, I'll never know what this man's intentions were, but I'm thankful I listened to my gut anyway, even if it took me a hot minute to smarten up. At the time this happened, I did not think much of it until looking back on it from the perspective of an adult that's more mature and more wiser. Now, as I revisit the memory of this encounter, I am convinced that something more sinister was at play, but I'll never know for sure. I was 17 years old, and as teenagers tend to be, a lot less cautious than a young girl of my age ought to be, especially in a new country completely foreign to her. I was on vacation with my family to escape the cold winter up north. My parents were very liberal about giving me the breathing room that I desired, and I wasted no opportunity to use that to my advantage, especially as much as I was afforded. It was a family resort and nobody was all that concerned about anything happening. I guess you could say that we all had vacation blinders out, so to speak. Every night, after the sun went down, I liked to wander off to the pool to swim and soak in the hot tub. Meanwhile, my parents stayed in their rooms. When you're basking in the lap of luxury at a high-end resort, you don't think about the potential for danger, 
In hindsight, I suppose this is why tourists are considered ideal targets for predatory activity. Being on vacation made me more sociable and additionally, more trusting than I normally would be. I admit that. The false security that came from being within the security of this protected resort did cause me to lower my guard a lot. The fact that I had already been going to and from the pool area by myself every night, with no incident, this was why my confidence was so high. While my parents gave me the breathing room to enjoy my independence, I was here to make friends and have a good time. I didn't care much about anything else. So just like any other night during my stay, I was lounging in the hot tub, chattering amongst the guests, all my worries completely forgotten for the moment. I was getting a lot of attention, mainly because it was apparent I was Canadian, and all the guests amongst me were apparently fascinated by that. I was barraged with questions, some of which I could not decipher whether they were genuine or trolling. Yes, we do have heat and electricity up north, I kid you not, I was actually asked that. Amongst this group of people, I was particularly invested in this conversation I was having with a much older man. He came off as nothing but warm and friendly. He had claimed he too was on vacation with his family, but they were nowhere to be seen. In fact, not including myself of course, he was the only one who seemed to not know anyone there. Everyone else was there with their families. I figured though that that was normal. However, because I too was vacationing with my family and they were nowhere in sight either, what struck me as more odd is how I seemed to be engaging only me in conversation and ignoring everyone else. It was also nearly three times my age. That doesn't help matters. As the night progressed, people began retreating to their rooms leaving just me, this man, and a few others. It was around this time that he shared with me what room he was staying at before asking, innocently, where I was staying. I foolishly told him, but only the sectional area, although he had asked which room specifically, I had enough sense to not divulge that information. Things didn't take a particularly unsettling turn until I began to notice how eerily quiet things had become. There were still some people around, but it was just me and him in the hot tub now. I took this as my cue to start heading back. Bidding him goodbye, I got up to leave, but he instantly stopped me. He insisted that he walk me back to my room, as it's not safe for a pretty little thing like me to be wandering around the resort by myself, especially at this late hour of night. I took this for concern, akin to a protective uncle, but waved off the supposed hospitality insisting that I was going to be alright. He became more persistent, switching from concerned guardian to fearmongerer. He told me how bad things happen to young girls like me without an escort, as he droned on about the dangers that might surely befall me as a young female on vacation with no parents around to guard me. A small and defenseless young girl, I felt the first wave of unease wash over me. I shook it off and smiled warmly, telling him thank you but that I would manage fine on my own. He seemed to deflate as his expression became more exasperated. At least let me walk you part of the way there until I know you're safe. This puzzled me. If in fact there were predators lurking around, how would I feel any safer walking from the halfway point from where I was now, besides it being a shorter trek? Nevertheless, his show of concern was beginning to wear me down he had gotten me thinking about how dark it now was, and the vulnerable position that I was currently in. He was right. I practically had a target on my back. Okay, I nodded, after a moment of hesitation. I was young and naive and thought it to be an advantage to have someone larger and stronger to walk with me. I know, I know, I was an incredibly foolish and sheltered teenager, with far too much faith in humanity as a whole. Very unlike the cynical and distrustful woman I am now, who always follows her gut. I also, as annoyingly typical as this sounds, did not want to be rude. Fortunately, I have since grown out of my people-pleasing complex and will not hesitate to say no when I feel uncomfortable at the first sign of a red flag, but had yet to develop the quality then. I essentially relented. At the moment, 
My fear of coming off as rude to an adult overrode that of any subconscious or otherwise concern I had for my safety. His eyes lit up and he nodded approvingly. Good, let's get going then. It's late and your parents will worry. I ignored the twisting in my gut and rose from the hot tub, shivering from the sudden exposure of the cold air. Suddenly, I was feeling too exposed. I hastily fastened my towel around myself and padded towards the lockers. At this point, I was just determined to get back to safety and to the wharf of my hotel room. It was only as I was getting closer to leaving that I began to get this sinking feeling in my stomach that something about this whole night just wasn't right. My suspicions were further affirmed as I took a note to my escort following me. The lockers were outside, and the women's changing room to the left of them. I was going to retrieve my clothes from the locker, change in the locker room, and then go with this complete stranger who I didn't know at all. I noticed he was standing a little too closely now, and I instinctively shrunk away from him. This definitely wasn't right. However, it wasn't until I was shakingly pulling my top on over my soaked bikini top, having already been decided I would skip the locker room, which regrettably assented my womanly curves a little more than I was comfortable with at the moment, and of which he seemed to notice as well, that I decided I could not wander off with this strange man that I hardly knew. Any last bit of false security had now gone away the moment I felt his eyes on me, watching me dress, his eyes clearly appraising my body. I shivered again, this time not from the cold. As I pulled on the rest of my clothes, I had already made my decision. You know, I really appreciate you offering to walk me back, but I think I will manage after all. Thank you, though. He now grew solemnly quiet which stirred a growing sense of malice within me as I began to feel more and more validated in my decision not to go off with this man. Are you sure? He pressed. I would hate for anything to happen to you. I nodded more intensely and forced a smile. No, it's all right. I'll be fine. Thank you. Okay, he said quietly as I practically started running for the exit while still in earshot. Behind me, I heard him say, You be careful now. You never know who might be out there. As soon as I was out of his sight, I began bolting and was stopped in my tracks instantly by the second wave of impending dread to hit me that night. I decided against walking back on foot and headed towards the one resort shuttle instead. On the way, on two separate occasions within the space of no more than ten minutes, Two older men in their fifties made a pass at me, and at the shuttle stop, a group of men in a car offered to give me a ride, but I ended up making it back safely from the shuttle without any further incident. Later on, I wrote it off as paranoia, and I convinced myself that he really was just a hospitable older man with a young girl's best interests at heart. But now that I know from personal experience how the men that seemed the nicest with seemingly good intentions often are the worst predators. I am convinced that I made the right decision that night. Hello everyone, thank you for listening to the Creepy Fox Podcast. If this is the first time you've joined us, then make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it. That way you'll be notified of any and all future uploads coming here to the Creepy Fox. Also, if you enjoyed it, make sure to leave a like rating and a comment down below telling me what you all thought. And make sure to pick up some Creepy Fox merchandise if you like. That's available right below the video player. Now, I'd like to go ahead and give a very special thank you to all our channel members. Thank you to Robbie, Bo, Spunky the Nutcase, Rice and Beans, Linz, Maribel, Medu Saltil, Dread Archive, Sean, Jen, Corey, and Sylvia. Thank you, of course, to all the regular viewers who constantly tune in and listen to the videos and share them with family and friends. It really does go a long way to help out the Creepy Fox family grow. Speaking of that, if you'd like to go ahead and share your own story for a future episode, then make sure to send it in using the user submissions email on screen. That's tcfnarrations at gmail.com. 
As you saw today, we did go ahead and feature some stories from Reddit. I have discussed this in the past, and because I want to go ahead and give you guys more videos without you having to wait forever for new uploads, I'll be going ahead and including stories from Reddit, along with the scary stories that subscribers send. Thank you for understanding. So, that's going to go ahead and do it for today. I'll catch you all on the next episode. Until then, take care, and have yourself an amazing day.